Welcome to A Celtic State of Mind. I'm Paul John Dykes. And is this the first time you guys have been on the show together for a long, long time? Maybe a match day back in the, the deepest, darkest yeah, days of lockdown? No, we've, we've, we've done a couple of Thursday shows together. Yeah. It's, yeah. You've done a few Thursdays, but yesterday, am I right in saying it was the first time you met in person? It was a beautiful encounter, Paul. Was it? Yeah, Talk us through it, Colin. Talk us through it. Just after having walked all the way from Rutherland down to the stadium... Heading into the Montford just to have the, the you know the the last pre match drink just to get the the nerves out mm-hmm. and uh, we tap on the shoulder finally get to see you in person it's a beautiful day was a big cuddles so JP was a big hugs yeah. I, put my arm them. That's it. That's it. I just went Colin what how you doing <laughs> <laughs> Colin what and you would have recognised the the voice obviously Colin was talking about settling the nerves uh, JP how were you feeling at that point were you nervous um. I, I don't know. I think I think you don't you don't ever like to go into these games getting cocky or or ahead of yourself because well when you've experienced what we've experienced, particularly myself and you, Paul, and, and growing up, you you don't like to count your chickens. So I was quietly confident. I, I thought if we if we came and played our game, we would we would maybe come away with it. The victory, but uh, I, I was just looking forward to it. I was just so relieved to be there. I was so relieved to be at the game and not watching it on the TV. I think that that was my overwhelming feeling. Was just like, thank God I'm here and and one of the lucky ones, you know, not 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 having to watch it on TV because it's I, I find it absolutely torturous watching it on TV. That's when it really reminds me of the nineties because I wasn't going to uh, certainly not going to Rangers games in the nineties as much. I only went to a handful because they were hard to get. Tickets for, and uh, you, you know, if you weren't a season ticket holder, you, you you would struggle. So, aye, it was good to be there and good to meet Colin. Uh, absolutely. Now, um, you've just reminded me on, on Friday and Saturday, everybody that we spoke to at the Axom events, I was asking them if they had a ticket. Very few people did uh, have tickets for the game. So, yeah, two out of three of us were at the game. And um, Colin, when the team was announced, uh, Laura and I were discussing before the game that uh, we certainly believe that when everybody's fit, Hundred percent fit. That's the strongest team. Would you Would you agree with that? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, obviously, we had the, the big discussion last week about players that were coming back from injury and whatnot. And looking at that lineup, um, I was delighted when I saw it. I thought that's the best eleven we could put out. The bench looked strong. The, it was definitely a real pickup compared to some of the other times that you've turned up at Hamden and seen that we turned Coat Lewis, Ham- uh, Lewis Morgan playing up front, not Lewis Hamilton, he's yeah, yeah. Coat as well, but hey-ho. Uh, I think it was, we saw the Lewis Morgan video over the weekend. Yeah, bye. yeah. got played that in not, the top before the game, yeah. I've not, yeah. Seen, I've not seen it. Talk me through it, Colin. Uh, I was um, kind of hmm. on a, a bit of a treadmill over the weekend, unfortunately not a, a, a real treadmill. Uh, that <laughs> might come at some point this week. So Friday, Saturday, right into the game on Sunday. So going into the game on Sunday, I didn't even know that uh, Inverness were in the final because <laughs> I'd just been so up to, you know, what is it they call it? Up to high dough. That's what I had been Friday, Saturday. So talk me through what, what's been going on with Lewis Morgan, the wee turncoat, as you call him. I was... Um... He was interviewed by was it Goal or something? JP I can't remember who. Yeah, it was. No, sure. I just I got played it in the pub. And I just heard it. I never saw it. I just heard it. It's one of those this or that sort of questions, and he's asked about uh, Celtic or Rangers, and basically he turns around and says, "Oh, Rangers! I, I grew up a Rangers fan. Uh, I got the biggest opportunity of my life to play for Celtic, but now that I've left, I can go back to to Rangers." And it's like. The guy doesn't have a clue about loyalty. He's a green-up boy that played for St Mirren and he's a Rangers fan that played for Celtic. The guy's got no clue. He's a turncoat. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, well. Oh, well. Listen, Nate Great lost to Celtic, let's be honest. Um, What I talked about yesterday, it was was one of the games I'm going into and I said exactly what JP said there. Um, Quietly confident, but no overconfident, JP, because anything can happen, and anything can happen in a cup game against anyone. So, and by the way, we'll be thinking about that going into the final. So, going into it, I, I kind of thought to myself, if we're at our best, we will win comfortably. We weren't at our best, but you know, I've seen a, a big narrative actually developing about how how poor Celtic were, or how uh, Rangers were all over 
all over us and all this kind of stuff. I didn't see it that way at all, JP. I, I seen the game completely different. It was quite calm throughout the game, to be honest with you. There was a few wee flurries, a few chances. It's a cup semi-final. They're going to get a few chances, but I thought we defended marvellously yesterday. I think what's happened is um, a team's been built with a mentality that it just it just stays the same. and It, it, it stays the same. And I watched the interview this morning with Jota on Celtic TV and he just sort of said um, you know we've got this mentality that we we carry on to, to every game and, and it just permeates around the club that regardless of what we are presented with as a as an obstacle obviously there's been there's been a bridge too far in in terms of the Champions League this season you know we've not been able to cope with the might of Real Madrid which is hardly a, a <laughs> hardly a, a sort of cross the bear, you know, like, obviously miles away from what Real Madrid are and, and, and continue to be, but um, everything we were presented with in terms of games against Rangers, the obstacles that we come up against, they always seem to just ride the, ride the, ride the wave and mm -hmm. see, see through moments of, not chaos, but just moments of pressure and... Everybody trusts each other. You see that. You see the the spirit in the team. If you've got that spirit in the team, that will carry you through moments where you are up against it a little bit. Because let's not forget that was their season yesterday. That was their entire season, and that was their a lot of their players trying to rescue their own personal legacies within that club. Because fifty five only goes so far, and what have they done since then, really? Not we got to the European final. Fair, okay. I can't can't ignore that because immediately somebody will come back and be like, "Oh, we got to the European final." Yeah, but you lost it, and you've not kicked on since then, and you've embarrassed yourselves in the Champions League as the worst team uh, in its history. So that that's what I saw yesterday. I saw players desperately trying to, well, not even desperately trying to uh, regain their, retain their legacy or retain a legacy. And I'm not saying anything different to what they're saying because this is right. exactly what they're saying. And yeah. you know, you, you hit the nail on the head there, JP. It's serial losers. That's what that team is built on, is serial losers. Mm -hmm. I saw a stat yesterday saying something along the lines of since the, the Hibs Cup final, they've been to Hamden 17 times or something like that and they've only won four. I mean, they, they are serial losers. We've got a guy... Who hobbled off the pitch yesterday, and I hope he does. I hope he's he's back fit for next season. And Alistair Johnson, mm -hmm. he's going to walk away with three trophies. Hopefully this season. That's like more than anything that James Tavernier's had in his seven eight years that he's been at Rangers. It just they are serial losers. They're they're building into that mentality as well. Things like Cantwell trying to hide the water bottles from Hatati and this bigging up the crowd. He did that more than he did completed passes. He, they're, they're serial, serial losers and mm -hmm. that is, I mean I don't know if you've ever heard the term Espanolification but that is exactly what has happened to Rangers now they they are so happy that they got that close, it's like old Gil from The Simpsons when he says, oh we nearly got it that, that that's Rangers in a nutshell You're right, you're absolutely right and it is a mentality and we're on the two ends of the scale and just built a winning mentality as JP says but as you're quite rightly saying, Colin, um, if you are a loser, that that's something that is very difficult to overcome that. And by the way, another thing I would point out is after the game, Ange Postacoglu was, was being interviewed and he was talking about the quality of Rangers. He was talking about how well they have done in winning a league and getting to a European final. And he showed them the ultimate respect Right, And by the way, it's a touch of class, JP, because we've spoken about it in relation to Martin O'Neill. Martin O'Neill was exactly the same. And and you know what? It actually shames them when you look at some of the racket that was coming out of Ibrox in the lead-up to this game. And she'd apparently said things that upset people and left bad tastes in people's I mouths and all that nonsense. I figure out what that was. Like, what was it? Exactly. I honestly don't remember seeing anything that would have been misconstrued or or picked up on to be like, oh, I'll nail that to the dressing room wall, like he said that, and I'm like, what exactly did he say? Like, I, don't, I don't get it, but... No, no. But it's people focusing too much on everybody else, and you've got to concentrate on the own, your own job at hand, and that's exactly what Ange Postacoglu has done. I'm really keen to get people's thoughts in here. There's loads to discuss. We'll come back to what you were saying there about Cantwell. Um, and again, you read the headlines, and it's gamesmanship. That's no gamesmanship. That, that kind of behaviour, right, is playing up 
to a certain element. And you were saying, trying to get the crowd up for it as well, um, Colin. It's all about content for that guy. You know, he's thinking to himself, right, if I get a super slow-mo, I can up upload it to my socials. An absolute yeah. nonsense. But by the way, if that's what they're all about in terms of a fan base and that's what gets them going and gets them excited, I'm happy with that because I get excited by winning games and, and seeing Jota scoring goals and celebrating. Um, Ed Ed on the YouTube, a beautiful Monday, lads and lassies. Um, yeah, it certainly is. And Stephen Burns, uh, hello from Gala Shields. We had a great day with had yesterday in the Paradise Rooms. Where did you watch the game? Let us know uh, which part of the world. Alice there, Johnston. Hail, hail. It might actually be our very own AJ. Um, and he's maybe just spelled his name wrong. Hail, hail. All good to see the house that Ange built isn't straw and the big bad wolf can huff and puff, but it will never fall down. I quite like that. Is this Kevin Graham in disguise? Um, mm. But yeah, we're talking about the performance yesterday. And the first thing was, you guys were at the game. I'm trying to, to see through smoke. Um, on the telly, and they kept panning away, calling to the the wide shot, but you basically couldn't see anything. But if they, you know, if they cut to a camera that was pitch side, you could see exactly what was going on. Uh, what was it like in the in the stadium? What was the atmosphere like? Atmosphere was tremendous, especially before kickoff. Um, you could tell everybody was really up for it. Uh, when the, the teams came out, there was just this eruption of noise. It was it was brilliant. Having seen it back and taking a look at. Got to say, fair play to both teams, by the way, because they actually created some atmosphere for the the teams to come out to. Um, was quite funny, but you could see Don Robertson was desperate to kick the game off, but he couldn't see the touchline, so it just kind of kept going and kept going until it eventually cleared. Um, but yeah, fantastic. Um, and the crowd never stopped for ninety minutes. And we, we spoke about this before, talking about how. Going to games and maybe you go to a full Celtic park, there's no Rangers fans there, or you go to Ibrox and there's no Celtic fans there. I don't think there's space for that. And atmospheres like that yesterday shows that, okay, not every game's going to be 50-50, but just even having that other element of their fans there, it got the Celtic fans going. Every time they tried something, the Celtic fans reacted. Every time the Celtic fans did something, the Rangers fans reacted. It kept it going for the whole 90 minutes. And I, I'd, it goes back to something we spoke about before. I would like to see the allocation return just to get that atmosphere going. See, the thing with that, that there, there is a big issue in that they've sold the tickets, JP. They've sold the seats to season ticket holders. So there's there's going to be a real issue unless they have a dip in season ticket sales. Only then, I think, would they uh, be interested in returning to something like the, the previous allocation because it's gone so far down the line. As I say, it, people go on about um, the fact that you know people in directors' boxes and, and hospitality and corporate were looking at Celtic celebrating game after game, tying scarves to the post, putting stewards on the post to stop it from happening. <laughs> Um, and yeah, I'm pretty sure that annoyed them. But I think the bigger issue there was they wanted the seats because they wanted to get that money in early at the beginning of the season. They wanted the investment and they wanted to increase their season tickets without increasing the capacity. I mean, I think a big part of it was down to that. And if they have sold the seats, you know, it is very unlikely um, in the near future for us to return to the allocation, JP. <laughs> well, I think they, their season ticket renewals are out already so we would have heard if there'd have been a, a sizable amount of their fans that weren't able to get their current season book seat so that would lead you to believe that it's not going to change for next season which i i was kind of optimistic that it might do because there was a lot of noises being made by people in the media as if not that they knew something but just like callum mcgregor was saying things about you know hopefully we can get back to to that and make, making uh, noises as if it was an actual thing that was on the horizon or on the agenda, but mm. Rangers obviously didn't get that agenda. So, uh, <laughs> didn't get uh, a memo. But speaking of seats, an unbelievable thing happened yesterday. And one of those things, I've hardly spoken to anybody about this really, apart from my pal that I was way after the game. <clears throat> um, but when I was walking along the road to take my seat, so it was maybe like, I don't know. 10 minutes before kickoff or something like that. So I did get 10 minutes of the atmosphere and the build-up. Um, it just uh, took ages to get in. I went to the wrong bit. I went to, like, I was in F4, and I went round the other side of the ground, but obviously it stops at uh, G, and then F's round here. So stupidity on my part, but um may have had something to do with my uh, pre-match medicinal <laughs> intake. Um, <laughs> but uh, I, got, I got in the row, and I was walking along the row, and 
I could not believe who I saw as I was approaching my seat because I knew I was going to be sitting next to them. The guy, the guys that sit behind me at Celtic Park. Is that right? Aye, like uh, Pierce, who I've watched grow up from being a wee boy to he's now like eighteen, right? and his granddad Eddie. But Eddie and Pierce were sitting in eighty, I think it was eighty four and eighty five, and I was eighty two, and the guy in eighty three swapped me so I could sit next to them, and I was just yeah. like. I just said to him, I was like, there's no way we're losing this game today. I'm not, I'm, I'm just refused to believe that's going to happen. It was just so brilliant. I mean, I've, I've sat in front of them. They're, they're directly behind me, but I've sat in front of them for 10 years and I've never seen them. I don't think I've ever seen them outside the Celtic Park. So it was really amazing to, to, to experience that. And when Jota scored, you know, the three of us just embraced. It was, it was so, so good. Listen, it was written in the stars, JP. Simple as yeah. that. You've met, you've mentioned Jota, so let's talk about him. He comes back into the game, Colin. He's a guy who I think when you look at him this season, um, he's certainly stepped up a, a level. I know that that throughout the season people have been talking about losses of form and all that, but over the campaign, and you look at the fact he got his goal against Real Madrid, he he is a thorn in the side of Rangers in the big games. He thrives on it. Um, and again, you've not had an opportunity to talk about his wee visit down to the Brazen Heat uh, as well with the double denim and all that. How great was that? Fantastic. I mean, you can clearly tell what was on the, the pre-match um, playlist yesterday. It was clearly Gary Oglife from the Brazen Head that he was playing. Um, but no, Jota, was, he was brilliant, brilliant yesterday. Um, considering it was his first game back in a while, you could see there was bits of sort of rust mm -hmm. in the early stages. He brushed that off. And then there was a very, very smart move from Ange to switch him over to the left-hand side um, because Barisic was already on a yellow card. Should have been should have been off. We've got to cover that as well. He should have been Too off right. long before half-time. I think what we need to do with that is talk about the entire performance of the officials, Colin, because it was, that was, that really, was poor. really, so really we'll, poor. We'll cover that in a second, but it's a smart move from Ange to switch the wingers to move. Dyson and... Um, Jota and switch them round because obviously Barisic already on a yellow card. What's the last thing he wants? Someone like Dyson Maeda running at him and hitting the byline because you've got to bring him down. And we see that when it gets to the goal. It's sort of in that whole play. But Jota, he just finds Tavernier sleeping once again. It's something that Celtic have capitalised on time and time again in this fixture is the fullbacks fall asleep. It's almost as if they get hit with a hip every time they go into their own box when they're defending a cross. They fall asleep all the time and in goes Jota. And it's the, one of the easiest goals he'll score for Celtic. He scored a fantastic header earlier on in the season. That was a, a lovely finish um, yesterday. The celebration, excellent. Um, look, he's genuinely, and I, I say this, probably I, I might come back to regret it. I think he will be a world-class player going forward. Listen, if you look at his kind of early career, remember uh, the the clause in his contract. I know a lot of Portuguese clubs do this, but the, the clause in his contract, JP, was something unbelievable. It was like 50 million quid to sell him on. He was a prodigy. They, they did expect him to follow in the footsteps of the greats uh, coming through in the Benfica side. Didn't really materialise for him. Um, and by the way, we're lucky because had it done so, we, we wouldn't have the pleasure of watching him uh, week in, week out. But that goal, for me, there's so many elements to it. The first one being, and we'll talk about every single player who was involved in it. First one being, let's talk about Jota's composure because four minutes before that, he said the chance of the match, JP, and the ball's trundled under his studs. You would yeah. never expect it. But he's managed just, it's not on his head. He's not, you know, overthinking uh, that. There's no labour in it. And, he's, and his head's not down. It's almost as if he's just, right, start again, refresh. Because when that ball comes round, yeah, Taverner's sleeping, but Jota's so quick off the mark as well. And then you you know that somebody on Twitter is going to zoom in on Taverner's face as he's trying to, if he's realised that Jota's nipped in behind him and there's this despair. Uh, there's also a really good close-up of Alan McGregor as well, trying to stop it from going in. Uh, but Jota, sharp as anything when you consider that he's been out for a wee while. Well, I don't think you're in that team unless you are sharp. I think that there must be some way of measuring that <laughs> in the week leading up to the game because, oh, I'm sure there is obviously statistics that they can look at and they'll know if a player is going to be at it or not. But I think it's all about 
the mental attitude as well, as well as physical. Um, because just I can't believe that the whole we never stop thing was 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 slagged by not just Rangers, like the whole of like yeah. Scotland. You know, like, oh, yeah. I didn't ever stop. Oh, I you stopped against Real Madrid, and you stopped when you lost the semi final last year, and all the rest of it. But that mentality of we never stop has never been more apparent in that phase of play where they did stop, we yeah. didn't, and we scored a goal that won us through to a, a cup final and ended their season. Mm-hmm. That is actually, what there's actually a brilliant video of that that's on Twitter. I don't know if you saw it, no. but it's a replay of the goal, and it mm-hmm. is the speech that Ange, give, Ange gives right. in uh, the Celtic video about the whole we don't stop, we stop at half time, we stop at full time, and we stop to celebrate. And it's played over as the clip as Rangers obviously stop and made oh, a visit yeah. for the cross. Can you remember who uploaded it? You, uh, oh, no, I, you'll oh, find it, is, it went viral. Um, so you, you'll that- find it. The way they stop is absolutely criminal. The way they do stop is, I can't even believe, like, this myth about Raskin and Cantwell, Raskin's the guy that, like, gives the foul away or thinks yeah. he's giving the foul away and then he kind of goes like that as if to be like, what's happening? Why would you do that as a gesture? What, you're, you're playing football, you don't stop and give a gesture like that. That's what fans do. I don't, <laughs> I don't, imagine I don't. how close the game would have been if they actually played yesterday. Uh, oh, I'm oh, sorry, wait, they did I but know. there's a few elements to that, JP. The first one is uh, brilliant. I thought Matt O'Reilly will come to him as well. Kind of an understated performance, but you know, defensively brilliant, I thought, yesterday. And they did stop because it was a blatant foul, which we didn't get. And we'll come back on to that because Collins raised the, the performance of the officials was shocking. So they're thinking they're getting away with it for a moment. And, and uh, the, the reactions of Maeda, you see that turn and the way that he's able to dink that ball... As he turns, because he's facing in an opposite direction, and as he turns, he thinks it in. What a pass that is, by the way. And it's his second time, as I said, in four minutes where he's laid it on a plate. Um, I thought, you know, Maeda was astonishing. I thought his performance was outstanding. Talking about never stopping, he never stops. But you're right. I remember when that uh, mic'd up session was released on Celtic TV, and we were all raving about it. We loved it. We wanted a bit of belief in somebody, because at that time, and we'll come back to this as well, I think we needed uh, to believe in Ange at that moment in time. But I remember loads of people in the mainstream media going on about, uh, what's so special about that? that? That's the kind of sessions that you hear at every football club and all this kind of stuff. But he was creating a mantra. It wasn't so that you know the Celtic merch could print T-shirts and flags where we never stop on it. You know, because you get that impression sometimes that people will latch on to uh, this is only the beginning or the Ronnie Roar or bringing back the thunder and all this kind of nonsense. But Ange absolutely meant it. And uh, the club have shown and the players have shown that it was the real deal. And uh, he indeed is the real deal. But with regards to Maeda, I think going into this game as well, JP, people are saying you can't drop Maeda against Rangers. I think yesterday proved you just cannot. I mean, he is so important in games like that. It, it, it... 87th or 88th minute, he's back harrying and chasing at the at the left back position. I, I turned to, to Eddie and Pierce and I was like, how has he got anything left in his tank? He's ran about non-stop because you're looking at the substitutions and, and I think I actually said that as well. I was like, how Dyson Maid has played this full game and he's played it at that that same Unreal. level of, of energy. And you'd think uh, Mere mortals would have been substituted and they'd have been, you know, if it was a Scottish player, he'd probably been off after 60 minutes, absolutely blown out his proverbial. But Maeda's just made of completely different material. He's un- an unbelievable player who may not be, he may not possess that trickery, he may not possess that silk. He's not going to, you know, do a step over and then chip it up for himself and volley it in or something like that. But, and, and sometimes obviously his crossing is a bit wayward. Um, but that, the cross for the goal, brilliant. Did exactly what he needed to do. Used low centre of gravity to spin round, and then, and then the next thing, the ball's in the net as fast as that. By the way, see if you look at the unique angle that Celtic TV have put up of that goal. I mean, it's brilliant for a number of reasons because as Jota steps back to celebrate, you can see the entire uh, Rangers support uh, in various degrees of distress. Yeah. <laughs> uh, despair and distress but as as that foul happens right and uh, Raskin's going like that 
Ryan Kent starts running back to the halfway line. Really? He, he runs. He runs away from the, the the situation. You actually see. Watch it. You actually see him running back away away from the situation as if as if like, oh well, uh, nothing's happening there. And then it's there's a goal. So, the thing so. is, JP is the only time he got out. Alistair Johnson's back pocket. <laughs> so. An absolute myth, an absolute myth of a player. And talking of which, we're going to come on to the officials, uh, Colin, but we've mentioned uh, the kind of Cantwell antics, uh, the Raskin. You know, these types of players, where they're, they're hanging their hats on them. But what I've seen from uh, a Celtic perspective is they were trying to almost be hard men on the park. Uh, we've seen it in the first minute. Lundstrom fancies himself, right? So he goes through Kyogo really early doors and he escapes a booking. So this feeds into the point you made about officials as well, Colin. That was the moment where you you set down your marker and you say, right, that's a booking. Because, mm. by the way, it was worse than Carter Vickers' booking another in the last game where he got an early booking, if you remember. Mm-hmm. It was much worse than that, far more dangerous than that. And Kyogo actually got some really bad uh, treatment from, from Rangers. Davis managed to either elbow or forearm in the, in the throat. Don't know if you've seen that one, guys, at the game. And, you know, the commentary team are talking about the fact that it's because Kyogo, Kyogo's so small. That, that That's the reason that happened, because of the height of Kyogo. Absolute nonsense. And I, and I thought that from that first tackle, there was no control of the game. And you're looking at um, various, like even, you know, Tillman injured himself. It was Tillman injured himself, right? It was mm-hmm. Tillman, yeah? Yeah. He, he goes into Taylor. He tries to hurt Taylor. And he hurts himself, and it was it was a feature of the play. And I was thinking back to um, the old hammer throwing days, where Rangers specifically bought, bought players for that purpose. You know, players that would bite their legs and all this kind of stuff. You're Terry Hurlocks of this world, um, and they're not going for quality and flair. But conversely, you know, Celtic are known for their flair and their entertainment and, and the style of football. But when when we're faced with that battle, Colin. We've got enough players who can step up. I mean, you've mentioned Johnson, but I think you see it in McGregor. I see. I think you've seen it a lot more in players you wouldn't expect it as well. The likes of Jota. These guys um, can step up, and there's no harder centre half partnership than Starfield and Carter Vickers. So yesterday, I think, and this is where the tagline comes in. We know how to entertain, but see when there's a battle, we can step up and go toe to toe with them as well. Absolutely, and um, just to give a shout out to the person that we found out the Twitter account is Tam Selick's son. Uh, wow. The videos he put out is unbelievable. He's the best, best person to follow there on Twitter. Um, but there was a, a fantastic moment in the first half where last year's best player on earth, um, John Lundstrom, is put on his backside from a tackle from Starfelt. And that set the tone for what was coming because Cameron Carter Vickers and Starfelt were a wall yesterday. Unbelievable. Unbelievable performance from both of them. Yep. Um, nothing got past them. It, it was. I don't like comparing them too much, but the way you used to see John Terry throwing himself about uh, for Chelsea, getting in the way of everything, winning everything in the air, that was the way the two of them were playing yesterday. Uh, I know Cameron Carter Vickers got man of the match, but you could have easily given it to either of the two of them. I agree with that. Joe Hart, to be perfectly honest, because I thought he had a great game as well. He did. Uh, and that, that set the tone. But going back to the officiating, there was a moment in the first half where the ball gets played over the top, and it was, it was clearly a tactic that Celtic had deployed was to get the ball over the back of the fullbacks, and Barisic thinks he's Michael Jordan for a second, jumps up, basically handballs it out of play, and the ref goes, that's fine, it's just a throw-in. Now, I have a slight bit of sympathy for Robertson, because he wasn't meant to be the referee. Um, obviously, the referee got injured in the warm-up, but that is your first Glasgow derby. That is your chance to show the, the powers that be that you've got the ability to do that. Now, maybe not Bickenham did show the powers to be that they've got the ability to do that, but in terms of being an overall decent referee, he he bottled it several times yesterday. He did. Absolutely but see that bottled. see that moment? Because Jota's running onto it, isn't he? When Barisic yeah. uh, punches it off out of the park. Deliberate handball. There is no coming and going. There's no no grey area. It's just a booking. It's a book every day of the week. Every single day of the week. He gets a booking eventually, and then he dives just before half time. So let's focus on that. I mean, you know, there's three yellows, JP. Yeah, he, he plays the entire game. I don't know I if they hooked him later. Being the game, I thought that was a handball, but you've just confirmed that it was a handball. Yeah, because we all got that at the game. Was, <laughs> back. See when you see little LeBron going up for a block, it was literally like that hand straight down. Mm-hmm. It couldn't have been any clearer. That's so 
So the three the three points there. The first one was um, the hard men attitude, the plastic hard men attitude, JP, that we were getting from the likes of Cantwell and and Raskan. Um, the the incident that Colin mentioned earlier with the the water bag, you know, where Hatati's just thinking, I'm playing a game of football. There's my fellow professionals. There's there's a bottle of water there. Any chance? And the guy picks it up, and it's ridiculous. It's embarrassing. It's actually Move. embarrassing. Moves the see. bag like a like a child. He moves it like a child. You know, yeah. and eventually, Morelos is like, just take it, you know. It, it, but that whole thing, there's a lack of class there. It's embarrassing to watch. It, but, it, you know, it's, it feeds it feeds certain people who think, that's great, give them nothing, show them nothing. It doesn't work, JP. I would much rather, right, the approach of Ange Postacoglu after the game, the way he spoke about his opponents and the approach of Martin O'Neill when he took over at Celtic because it serves you much, much better. You don't become complacent. You don't think that anybody's due you anything. You know you've got to earn every single tackle, every single goal, every single win, and every trophy. So I'm I'm delighted if that's their attitude, but I can see that creeping in to the culture of that team. Yeah, I mean, if you've got your fans in the stand putting up banners that look like they were made in a primary five school class, um, those were the days, my friend, when we chased the Celtic end. No surrender. <laughs> Remember, I remember it was doing south. Something, someone made made a, a kind of parody of that, and it was like a wee boy going into the kitchen, and the, and the dad's got the the, the bed sheet suit, and, and what are you doing, daddy? You know, and he's there spray painting it. It's like, come on, man! Was oh, no. cool. There was no spray paint. That was that was a uh, pencil, was it? pencil, yeah. pencil. Yeah. Kiwi. It was horrendous. I, I mean, if I polish. If I'd have been in that end, I'd have been like, get that down, man. Like, that's it's a embarrassing. Beamer. But uh, if you've got the fans doing that, then it kind of stands to reason that the players are going to follow suit and the whole that moving of the water balls. Mm. Do, do you know, but I mean, Cantwell came up here and he's like, oh, you know, football's for everyone, rivalries, they come and go, blah, blah, blah. Next minute, he's totally buying into the culture. Mm-hmm. Um, but Gerard, Gerard done that as well, Colin. <sighs> But I just, I mean, you've got to be a special individual to actually believe in a lot of that stuff. I mean, some of the flags that were in that end yesterday, without <laughs> going into too much yeah. detail, I think everybody knows what we're talking about. Yeah. It was ridiculous. And then this whole playing up to the fans, why do you need to do that? Do your talking on the pitch. Like, it, play, it, play it, well, it. score goals, then go and do your wee gritty dance or whatever it is he does to celebrate. Nice Is it because you don't have you don't have the fiber, mate? He's compensating yep. for it. Yeah, he's man. absolutely compensating for the fact that he's come up here, he's got this reputation of being someone who was a massive talent when he was younger, he was meant to get all these big moves, it's never came off for him. This is meant to be his rebuild. What can you do? Oh, I'll get the fans on side, they'll love me, I'll, I'll put tackles in. The amount of things I've seen on Twitter saying, oh, he was the best player on the park by a country mail yesterday. For what? He played what one he decent, one decent pass. He, he played a cross field pass. If we're going to be throw. completely fair, that was it. He won a throw on the back heel. Did he? I, he back heeled off someone won a throw, and then he went like that to the crowd. And... He did, but see, the worst one was the fist punch by Barisic when somebody kicked the ball off his backside and it went out of the park and Barisic starts fist pumping Chris Iyer style. I'm thinking seriously, if that's your standards, if that's what you're playing up to, brilliant. Because we're just going to steamroll you for the next decade. You, you know, know what? if that is the mentality. Do you know what? See, when you think back to the the sort of the days of like John Gregg and Willie Henderson and guys like that. Before you, my could time, you ima- could you imagine seeing people like that on the park yesterday? Can you imagine I, them acting I know. like that. I know. I know. The way but, that they have, the way they have transcended is it's terrible. I mean, but it's levels, Colin. Genuine, there must be genuine old Rangers fans out there that. I'm, Embarrassed. That's cringe. The... It's just cringe. Uh, Stephen Donnelly. Oh, by the way, there was also somebody in the uh, was it the hospitality seat spat on a Celtic fan. I don't know if you've you seen know, that footage. Oh, it's um, I'm pretty sure that uh, they've got some good footage of them. So I'm oh, pretty they, sure they've got. for balance, by the way. <clears throat> before we before anybody says anything, and I'm sure there's probably some one or two. Put one or two of the other the other persuasion that would maybe put themselves through watching this, but. That Super Trooper song can get so far away from this. 100%. It's, I, 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 again, don't want to label the point, but if we're going to be slagging off their fans, then I don't understand why we 
Right, you've got to rise above that. You've got to be. You've got to show that class that we've just been talking about, JP. So bad, you know what man. I'm saying? It's so bad. <laughs> like it just doesn't. It doesn't fit with no. our current narrative at all. It's just like it's so so far out of out of whack with what we do and what we sing and say and act as a club. And you know, I really enjoyed the you can shove your coronation, you know, where it where it belongs at the end. I mean, that, that that's that, that that's the kind of thing I want. Sang on mass, and it was sang on mass by everybody in that in that end. Did you see that's made the the daytime TV today? Oh, did Good. it? It's on Jeremy Vine. Good. Yeah. Brand I mean, let's go along the road. It's got like big banners up saying "Let's celebrate the coronation of the king" and all this Union Jack nonsense everywhere, and you're just like, nobody cares about this. No. If you do, you're in the smallest minority. Going, I mean. The idea of like there being like tea parties and stuff in people's back gardens next weekend to celebrate that absolute buffoon of a man taking over a throne that doesn't mean anything to me or most people, most sane people when living in 2023, uh, it's the most small time parochial rubbish I've ever Unbelievable. seen. It's Unbelievable. Quite funny though. Did you not see the thing in the papers the other day and they were saying 75% of Scots don't give a a hoot about this. The other twenty five percent are Rangers fans. Listen, cash in all the jewelry, cash in all the gold, all the buildings, all that nonsense, and the spend, save on the spend, and and redistribute it amongst people who need it in the country. And you know what? You might have a modicum of respect if you were to do that. The the amount of money that they are spending on a coronation, rewind. I was doing the uh, research for the. Neely Mocking book, obviously the Coronation Cup. And when I was looking through the old newspapers up in the Mitchell and, and Glasgow, the amount of spend on that coronation was obnoxious as well. You know, and that was in nineteen what fifty three? Nineteen fifty three it was. So you know, you're talking seventy years on, we've not learned a lesson, we've not moved on. We're living in the dark ages, JP. We're living in a Disney movie. That's what it is. It's just everybody needs to wake up. And I think most people are particularly when, you know, folk are struggling. Folk are struggling day to day to put the heating on in their houses and you're, you're watching that absolute waste of money. So, yeah, all about that, JP. Every single one of us can sing that. But the mm. other song that you referenced uh, where you're celebrating the death of somebody that played for a football club, no, not for me whatsoever. And by the way, every time we mention it, JP, there are a, a few people that give us stick in the comments section, but I sure think the vast, ma vast majority of actual listeners agree with what we're saying here. Sure there are. And two people will probably be like, oh, call, call yourself a Celtic fan. We can sing what we want and this, that, and the next thing. And yeah, okay, yeah, you can sing what you want, but I would just ask you to stop and think about what that makes us look like. It tarnishes um, the club. That's 100%. It does. does. Is it you, you lose, you lose every bit of moral high ground that you have over them and others by placing it stuff like that. Just going back to the coronation, I've got to say I'm, I'm actually a bit disappointed because we're the current holders of the coronation cup, and I fancy that quadruple this year. Hmm. <laughs> no, no, we've got the we've got the quadruple because we won the Michael Beale League as well. Mate. Oh, yeah, sorry, all right, that's, well, I've got it. Well, I've got a quadruple. Copyright right. fans TV, he came up with that one. I'm not taking credit for that. <laughs> the great yeah. thing about uh, the first time we won it, Colin, was it was Celtic v Hibs, you know, and uh, that's that was the worst uh, kind of um, final that they could ever have envisaged. Uh, and, you know, the, the coronation uh, of a king, you know, the, the, the unelected head of state, unbelievable. The mind boggles. It absolutely it's boggles. It's got to be a rematch, a 2023 rematch for that trophy. It's got to be done. Well, play Hibs again. Yeah, 100%. Hail, hail, all. <laughs> are we going to sing? We could sing the song now, actually. Well, we song. That's a uh, we could, it's a tremendous song. We could sing it at the end of the show. How about that? We played The Glory in the Dream yesterday for the first time in ages. Stephen yeah. Donnelly, hail, hail, all. Shaking in my boots with this big Rangers revamp coming now. The thing with this is we are concentrating on Celtic, but they were our opponents at the weekend, and we have heard all the noise. And I think it's, uh, it's okay to have a look ahead to next season. Um, and we focus we focus on what Celtic are doing. But obviously, um, we've been told that they're coming and then we're going to see the real Rangers and then we've heard this time and time and time again. Um, and all, all throughout that, all we get from Manchester Call Blue and Celtic, mainly through the likes of Callum McGregor, uh, Colin, is what we're all about, what our mantra is and how we're looking to improve. And it's the only way that any football club can, can improve. You can't keep looking over your shoulder at what others are doing. 
I think the light bulb's starting to hit for a lot of Rangers fans when you, you listen to the, the phone-ins and stuff and they realise that Celtic actually have a model that works extremely well for them. Um, they've, they've got the players playing really, really well. When someone wants to move on, they don't hold them back. They reinvest the money. The players that they bring in totally understand the the sort of mantra of what it is to play for an Ange Postecoglou Celtic. Whereas at Rangers, they've, they've held on to them for far too long. They're going to lose these players on a free contract. They've then got to try and rebuild their whole team. As Bill said yesterday, the biggest rebuild they're ever going to have. Only two weeks after saying that most of the squad's going to be there for next season. So I don't know how he's going to fit them all in at Murray Park, but he's going to do that. Um, genuinely, you listen to Celtic and it's not as if it's just one or two players. Like It's not just McGregor, it's not just Hart, it's not just Cameron Carter-Vickers. Everybody buys into it. Every single player, doesn't matter whether they're a squad player, doesn't matter whether they're a first-team starter, they buy into it. Even Greg Taylor's post-match interview yesterday um, totally played up to it when he was asked, oh, it looked as if you were tired in that second half. And he goes, do you think? Because I didn't think so. It's and not he, part of their vocabulary. No. So it's almost as if they're, they're, they're watching the manager and what he, how he approaches the media, and they're taking that on as well. So everything that Ange does is setting an example for the rest of the squad, and everybody buying into it is the reason why we're so far in front. You're right. And see the thing, JP, speaking to kind of older selves, and they talk about when you walk into a dressing room and you, you know you sit down and you look to your left and your right, there's players that you think to yourself, they can inspire you, you believe in them. It's almost like, I've got this, guys, and you're slowly but surely becoming part of that. You imagine uh, what Ange is building here, and what you have is like a core. You've got a backbone. And then anybody else who comes and goes, you know, in the periphery of that to come in for two or three seasons. Um, as football fans, we don't generally like losing our heroes. But even that part of it, Ange's got us almost normalised to the thought of a hero going because you know that the heartbeat of that and the culture and the mentality that he's instilling will remain and he'll be able to replace them as well. That's definitely true, but I have to say, <laughs> um, if... God forbid the likes of Kyogo or Jota were to leave uh, in, in, in the calendar year. I think I would I would struggle with that a bit because you just, you just think that there's a lot more to come from them in a Celtic jersey mm. before they were to, to exit stage left or stage right. You know, it's just uh, the whole Champions League thing feels like unfinished business. We, we dipped our toe in this year or this season and at times stood up against the best. I mean, that first half against Real Madrid, we, we can't dine out on a, a first half uh, goal with draw with Real Madrid forever, but it did show you that with a few, you know, tinker, tinkering a wee bit here and there with that team and the squad, that we might have managed to get a second half. No, no, if we'd have just, or, or even better, God, who knows, we could have we could have gone one nil up if McGregor's goal, McGregor's shot goes in, and then you've got something to hold on to. But um, I, I just, I think, I think for as long as the players are all are all singing from the same hymn sheet, then long may that continue. And um, you don't you don't want to see you you want to see people obviously get the opportunity to progress their careers, and I'm sure that that will happen, particularly with the younger guys like Matt O'Reilly. He'll probably want to test himself in the Premier League because he's played in the lower divisions in England. Uh, so he'll, that'll be his probably long-term goal, I would imagine. Um, Kyogo, who knows? <laughs> I don't know what I don't know what the future holds for Kyogo beyond Celtic, whether or not he goes to a Premier League club or elsewhere in Europe. I don't know, but it, right now it just seems like perfect fits for those players. Mm -hmm. so, sometimes you 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 can easily see that. That uh, this player or that player that has outgrown Celtic, and right now I don't really see that for a lot of those players because I just think that there's there is room to develop them still. I, agree with that. I, I just think the first season under Ange Postecoglou was very much a as of getting to know you season, and this season's been the season where everybody's really put the foot down and motored and. You see that in everyone's performances, and that's why we're going for a clean sweep of trophies, um, which we potentially could have done last season. Which can you imagine how remarkable that would be? I mean, two trophies last season, including the league, was remarkable given this this the state that Ange Postecoglou took that team and squad over. 
And but to be going for five out of six in two seasons is is quite something. And Mind I think that, do you remember that interview where he was in that, an airport lounge and he got interviewed on BBC? Yeah, Mitchell. Yeah. Yeah. It was Mitchell, wasn't it? And I remember even from that interview, he said he said something like, "That's pretty strong language, mate." I, I, I can't remember what the guy said. Something like catastrophe. Catastrophe. That was it. He said catastrophe, and he went, "That's pretty strong language, mate." That's not really where. I see that. I see this as like the the beginning of something, mm-hmm. and I just I, I thought back to that interview as I watched them take the, the applause from the crowd yesterday, and I genuinely I mean this. I've I've never heard the noise like that when he walked over to the corner where we were, and it went up a level of, to a level of noise, and then it went up again, and yeah. I was just like, wow, this is actually frightening how loud this is because I've not heard. I've not heard that in in thirty five years of supporting Celtic. I've not heard as strong a support for a man like there is for Ange Postecoglou, which is it's just mad to think that you can get somebody that you've never heard of really before, and because of the way they are as a as a human being, the language they use, the success that they've brought, the sheer joy that they've brought you from the team that they've created, like. To, to, to be able to give that back, but to feel it from the whole support on mass was just it was unbelievable. And um, that, for for many reasons, that's one of the reasons I was grateful to be there yesterday. Yeah, yeah. you know, sorry, Colin. He mentioned after the game, he mentioned the semi final from last season and how far they've actually progressed and how big a disappointment that particular game was. But JP mentioned that Real Madrid game, uh, the three 0 game. And, um, I was trying to remember what the starting lineup was, and I had to check it. So the starting lineup was Hart, Juranovic, Taylor, Carter Vickers, and Jens, McGregor, Hatati, O'Reilly, Abada, Yakamakis, and Jota. So when, when you even think about that particular team, that isn't Ange, Angie's finished product. No. Yet, for 56 minutes, we were nothing each with Real Madrid, who are going to win the European Cup this season. Oh, yeah, God. definitely. Uh, and just going back on what JP was saying there, I mean, JP, you're a music man, so you'll remember this. Um, when Robbie left Take That and they had to open up the, <laughs> the <laughs> for, for people that were so gutted. I mean, if Celtic right, Sorry, let's go back. When Robbie, when Robbie left Take That, what did they have to do, Colin? They opened up a, they opened up a, a helpline for all the did fans they? that were so gutted. Um, right. See if Celtic sell, sell either or both of Kyogo and Jota this summer, they're going to have to open up a fan line up at Celtic Park because, I mean, our views will go through the roof. Everybody will be greeting. But no, seriously, though, I mean, going back to, to what you were saying there, like, when you look at that, the reason, that you, you mentioned that Real Madrid team and who we put out that day. Mm-hmm. You look at where we are now. We spoke earlier on about this being probably the strongest team yeah. that, that we can put out just now, right? Mm-hmm. This is still Celtic in... A rebuild phase. There is still levels to go. We can still bring in players that can take us to yeah. that next level. So we we spoke about obviously Real Madrid beat us eight one over on aggregate. Um, we we only picked up a couple of points in the Champions League. The target next year will to be to go higher than that again, and then get out into the last sixteen. And Ange, this is part of Ange's plan. Now there's talk. I mean, we saw the the. The managers that get let go down south and how quickly Ange gets. Um, Don't mention Brendan Rodgers. Yeah, I saw him at Celtic Park yesterday. He was, he was trying to do a Michael Beal maybe um, and be around just in case the manager left. But <laughs> seriously, um, when you look at it, this is the reason why Ange will never go and take one of those jobs because Ange is all about the plan. You take a, a look at the, the other teams he's been at and how it's taken him time to implement his style bring in his own players, get up to that next level. There is no way that Ange steps away from that. Even listening to, to old Hugh Keevans yesterday, he was talking about, you look at Ange and that's a man that's there for next season. Ange is always thinking a, a transfer window ahead. He's not thinking yeah. of the summer. He's got the summer in mind. He knows exactly who he's bringing in. He's thinking of January ahead for next season. You've already he's said it, Colin. that time down south. He's brought the summer transfers in already. Yeah. The ones that he brings in summer are for the, you know, to bed them in for the next uh, period. I'm going to ask you the question. And that, that team that, that went out yesterday and were saying, potentially, there, there might be people disagreeing. There might be people saying, you know, I wouldn't play O'Reilly, I'd play Moy, whatever it might be. 
But potentially that that is your strongest side. And you look at the ones who have left, and I'm going to ask you both the question: Juranovic, Yakamakis, Rogic, Beaton. Right? Be honest. Did they get into that side yesterday? Side or squad? Starting eleven. No. All no. four of them. No. no. So, no, no, and, I, and I'm basing that on what I've seen from the people that play in their position now and weighing that up against everything that they did when they were here. And mm. there's no way I wouldn't want Alistair Johnston starting in a game against them because he's just built for it. I mean, you saw the way he went into that tackle. My God, that his knee, his uh, shin clattered right off. It was both. Yeah. Was left gliding. And you could, oh, it, was, it was quite it hard have, to watch. Could have been a lot worse. I don't know. I, um, and then you think about Kyogo, what, five goals against them this season? Jack Amakis didn't score any. Okay, he didn't play maybe as many minutes as Kyogo has done, but I, there's no way you're putting Jack Amakis in over Kyogo in a game no. against them. Not now that Kyogo's broke his duck and, and, and knows what it's like to score. Uh, yesterday was a tight game. Wasn't I think maybe... Myself included, maybe we're thinking that we were going to go in and, and inflict some serious damage on them, but we didn't need to. We just needed to win the game. It was a, it was a cup game. We didn't need to beat them 3-4. Just needed to win, and we did. And we did it well. We've, we've shown many different facets of uh, this machine that's been built. Yeah. I'd, I'd, love to, I'd have loved to have had the quality of a Jack Amakis and a Juranovic on the bench for yourself. Oh. But... And even Tom Rogic, I think, would have been a, a great asset off the bench as well. I thought one of you would have said Rogic over Matt O'Reilly. No, I mean, Rogic, I mean, you take a look at it, he's not even on the bench for West Brom just now. That was a terrible career move for him. An oh, absolute yeah. terrible career move for him. <laughs> he, sh- he should have just stayed and signed another year's deal. Who else I mean, made that bad move, Colin? Oh, Celtic Celtic yeah, 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 yeah. Um, Samaras. Yeah. So he Hooper, really done the, Hooper done the exact same, do you know what I mean? It's, yeah. And I, that's why I say I think we're still a couple of players away, and I think this transfer window coming up will be massive to get those right players in. Yeah, you're right. And by the way, there's a good point coming in from uh, Rob Lully. It looks like Tierney is heading north, maybe not as far north as we may like, but hopefully the sell on feet is a good percentage. Now, that, that the reason I'm bringing that, fee, by the way, what was that? Don't think there is a sell on fee. Well, I've read there is. Mm-hmm. I've read there's a 10% on Tierney and there's a higher one on Frimpong. There's a higher one on Frimpong. And yeah, then yeah. Um, the Celts are here, boys, were getting uh, told that there was also a clause in the, the Christie deal of Bournemouth stay up. So what you could get in the summer is is a legacy amount of money that's also going to be added to the kitty. Um, so again, yeah. it goes into managing the club properly. You know? Sorry. Where's Tierney going? Newcastle. Let's talk about uh, Newcastle. When you take a look at it, and it's Celtic have done this right, and they've been doing it right for years and years and years. It's one of the reasons we are so far ahead of them, is the fact that it doesn't matter if we sell Frimpong for £12 million. Looking at the transfer he's going to get in the summer, we're going to get another £12 million on top of that. Mm-hmm. You could go as far back as Virgil van Dijk, and when he left Celtic, yeah. and what we got when he made his move to Liverpool. What did we well. get? £8 million. Another eight million on top of the, the twelve or thirteen that Southampton paid. Mm-hmm. So Celtic's cat is Celtic's budget for this summer could be twenty, thirty million just based on players that we've sold three, four years ago. Well, what well, again, we've been talking about the loans, uh, the amount of players out on loan, JP, twelve players out on loan, maybe two or three of them could um command a transfer fee. Uh, the rest of them obviously get them off the wage bill. And if you turn, let's say, ten players into Three and those three players are at the caliber of a Jota or a Carter Vickers at six and a half, seven million quid. The thing is, it sounds as though, wait a minute, we wouldn't do that. But if you're bringing in an additional kitty from sell on clauses and then you're you're getting you know 10 players off your, your wage bill and maybe bringing in a million or two, they're talking about two million for a Yeti. If we can mm-hmm. get two million pounds for a Yeti, that's a I'm serious. Yeah. A, a three million pound loss is a great bit of business at this moment in time. Um, and then on top of that, whatever the budget was, and you never hear Ange coming out and talking about budgets and all this kind of stuff. But when you actually look at it, we could, if we were to go out in the summer there, and we might lose one, 
I don't think we're at that point where we need to worry about Kyogo, Yota, Carter Vickers. I'm talking Abada. We might lose Abada if you want to look at the speculation around him. But if we bring in two players of the quality of Carter Vickers and Jota, as we did in the summer there, then, I mean, you're, you're just building and you're building and you're constantly pulling away domestically and you're building towards doing better in Europe, aren't you? Yeah, I mean, they, they're definitely going to, I mean, strengthen. There's no doubt about that. I don't think they can get any worse. I mean, the, the dying embers of that squad are, are apparent to even the most stodge of their support. Um, that's, that's some Hall of Fame quality players you're talking about there, JP. Well, I know sacrilege, perhaps, but um, no, they're they're they'll no doubt strengthen, and what they need to strengthen their squad is substantial. Um, but the scary thing for us and them is that I don't doubt that we'll strengthen as well. I, mm-hmm. We're not going to stand still. There's no way that we're just going to rest on our laurels and be like, oh well, you know, we've got this great type, we've got this great team, we've got this strong squad. That squad will will change over the summer. I can I can only see it getting getting stronger. I don't think the manager would would stand would stand for it getting weaker because he's he's not going to. He's not going to stand for performances. Draw. I mean, you saw how annoyed he was at last last Saturday's draw at home. I mean, I have no doubt that he was absolutely raging about that. I mean, we came out of there thinking we're going to uh, our lead at the top is going to be cut, and then it turned out to be <laughs> extended after the events of the following day. But um, I just don't think he will allow that to happen in, in any way, in any aspect of the club. Uh, I don't think he wants to. Be taking backward steps. Do you not remember the, the narrative this time last year? If Celtic signed Jota and Carter Vickers, that's twelve million pounds to stand still. Mm-hmm. People don't get it. They mm-hmm. don't fully understand that a good coach can develop players and bring them on. Yeah. So yeah, okay, it might have been the same two players that were there the year before, but they're, they're another year under the Ange Boster Coglu system. They're another year under the coaching. It's a great point. Integrated. So. Even the players that we've not seen the best of so far, and I have to say, I was actually quite impressed with Awata when he came on yesterday. I thought he added a bit. Of as well. he, took a, he took a dull one as well, Colin. Yep. Awata quite That's early right. on. Yep, Ralston did well when he came on as well. Yep, and you just imagine another twelve. So did Moy. Moy, JP said Moy. Yeah, yeah. And I think if you look at it, another twelve months. How good are those players going to be? So yeah, we've not seen Kobayashi. We've not seen the best of Awata yet. How, I mean, we could be sitting here this time next year saying these are quality players. We've spent really well in bringing these players in. Celtic aren't standing still and they won't stand still, as JP says, under Ange, because they might go out and spend a couple million pounds on players that we've already had, but it's the development and that's where Rangers have kind of, they've hit the ground because they don't develop any of that. There's no player that you take a look at in that Rangers team and think they're a better player than they were 12 months ago. They only seem to regress. They're regressing. They are, and and by the way, I think uh, the biggest issue is they've they've hung their hat on a, a guy like Kent for for too long, or on Morelos for too long. I mean, somebody who simply can't stay in shape to do their job properly. JP, I mean that that is a prerequisite. That is something. That's a basic requirement to do your job. Make sure you're fit. Yeah, I guess I guess that guy. Both of those guys have been dining out on what they did for fifty five. And that's and that's what they that was their their goal. And Connor Goldson said it in a halftime interview about the hunger. I remember when they lost to Hibs. Yeah, that's right. So yeah. I know he said, you know, I just don't think that. I mean that 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 was that was a huge huge alarm bell ringing there at that point for for their support. And obviously the Europa League run kind of papered over that. I mean, it seemed like it was a different team that was playing in the Europa League. Uh, last season, that completely separate entity to the, the league form and, and domestic form, because how they did that, I do not know. But they did how it. Much, how much of that do you think is down to the manager? Because I don't think they've improved the manager. I think Van Bronckhorst, as much as he had a poor start to the season with Rangers, is a far better manager than Michael Beale. Yeah, but they just didn't. They didn't fancy him. They didn't like the way he spoke in interviews. They said, you know, he, he didn't. He didn't stir them up. Yeah, pretty much. Pretty much. He might have. He might have had the 
the the the the the, the pedigree of being a, a former Rangers player, as in an actual Rangers player, um, back in the day, and obviously I had four memories, but there's a massive difference between being a a good player and a good manager, or, or the manager that they want, the type of manager they want, the figurehead of their club, and he he didn't fit well a lot of them just because, yeah, he didn't really like tick tick a lot of those boxes. Whereas Michael Beale's associated with fifty five, but we all know what happened in that season, and we all know how that unravelled. So I really don't. I think for well, maybe for a few of them, they're starting to be like. Well, I mean, Gerard's not really exactly setting the world on fire as a manager now. I mean, and Michael Beale was his right hand man. I mean, in fact, Michael Beale wasn't even his right hand man. It was Gary McAllister. <laughs> Nobody's like, making uh, making play for Gary McAllister. Uh, I don't know what he's even doing right now as a as a in, in his profession. But I just don't think that what from what I've seen of Michael Beale so far, I'm very little to be fearful yeah. of in terms of what he can can or cannot do with a group of players. Time will tell. Time will tell. And that's what we're doing. We're looking at next season, JP, and I think that you know everything was thrown at that. They had to stop that particular campaign. Uh, they couldn't handle Celtic winning the 10. They've done that. There's been a wee knock-on um, following that with regards to player sales and European runs. But that eventually, the wheels fall off of that, and that's what's happened this season. And the rebuild they've got is absolutely huge. When we had to do a rebuild or a refresh, we had assets on the park that we could sell. We had money. We had a club that was properly run and we had a recruitment system that worked. Um, they don't have any of that. So they can deal with all that chaos and mess that uh, they're faced with and Celtic can can build and continue to get stronger. Uh, by the way, one thing I, I picked up after the game was um, the talk around Carter Vickers being rested. You just kind of hope, Colin, that you can give rest to, like, say, um, Alistair Johnston, Carter Vickers, maybe even Greg Taylor, who apparently was nursing yeah. a an injury as well, they were managing that and get get games into Ralston and get games into Burnaby uh, Kobe. and Kobayashi as well between now and the end of the season. Yeah, hundred um, percent. It was it was actually quite funny. I don't know if you you heard the the interview with fans after the game, but he was talking about Cameron Carter Vickers and he was saying that he'd quite have liked him to go a bit earlier to go and get it done. He wanted them back sooner within pre season and stuff like that. But Cameron Carter Vickers was determined to play that game yesterday. And to quote Anne, she says, uh, I was too scared of him to tell him no. Um, so, yeah, I, I totally understand that. The man is a, it does look like a complete, a, a big gentle giant, but I'm sure if he wanted his way, he would get it, put it that way. Um, mm-hmm. So, yeah, it's good that he's going to be able to get, what is it, three, four weeks now till the end of the season, go and get the, the operation, get him back fit for pre-season. Greg Taylor, I'm not 100% sure, because I think if Scotland got a couple of games over the summer, um, potentially... Yeah, so, yeah. So I think he might wait and see if he can get into the squad for that first before um, he goes to get whatever he has to get done. Johnston again, as you say, no point in risking them. Just sort of rest them up. Um, it's it's good to see that we're in this position now because, as you say, you can give game time to these players. And now that the league's wrapped up and we're we're headed towards a the title, then now's the games that we can throw the likes of Rocco Vata. We can throw Ben Summers in because the pressure's off and they can actually play their football. We're not relying on them to try and turn the game around. They can just go out and enjoy themselves. Express themselves, absolutely. By the way, JP, it's been great to see you on a Monday. There's quite a few people asking for you at the gigs. Um, so the actual... The rumours of my demise have been greatly exaggerated. <laughs> I, got, I love that. Are you still on Axon? Like, life gets in the way sometimes. I think I've had a pretty decent run of being able to do it every Thursday for the majority of the last three years three or whatever. Years. Ah, definitely, uh, so, uh, yeah, sometimes things come up and they ha- happen to be on a Thursday, so um, that's why I've not been around, but um, I uh, I thought I would... You mean, you mean you've got a job, JP? We're, we're unemployed. Uh, uh, yeah, uh, I've, got a, I've got a job. I saw Kev on, uh, and your brother on uh, your brother on Friday, Jamie, and then I saw Kev on Saturday at Steve Mason. Oh, uh, Steve Mason! What a gig, by the way! What a gig! I mean, I, I mean, we're we're a minute, an hour and four minutes in, and uh, I'm pretty sure I can actually say something a musical related. This, this is a bonus content. This is a bonus uh, content at the end of the show. Today I gig with 
the singer for a band that I've loved since I was what nineteen twenty, mm-hmm. mm-hmm. uh, and him to be really sound and you know having having a chat with him before before and after the gig, um, was just brilliant. And he played a couple of Vita band songs as well. Played uh, Squares and and our Meet Me, and it was just uh, the atmosphere in Touch was was half the scale. And uh, support band really good as well. Wax G Cast, um, featuring former member of Twisted Wheel. You ever heard of that band? Kind of like, I've, I've uh, heard of them, I the indie band. I the Wax G Cast from Halifax. Uh, they're supporting the Charlatans and Johnny Marr at Hal- uh, Peace Hall in Halifax. Super. And uh, I think they've just signed a publishing deal as well. So they, they're probably a band to, to look out for. Definitely, because Twisted Wheel was the name of a club down in Manchester, wasn't it? The yeah. Soul, kind of in the soul movement. Um, yeah. But Steve Mason, yeah, everything he'd done from King Biscuit time to the beat band to his solo stuff. And mm-hmm. I, I only recently found out, actually, uh, JP, this is an Iraq alert, but Brian Cannon and Microdot done the three EPs artwork. No way. He did. He'd done the three EPs plus the compilation album. He'd done the artwork for that, Microdot. Uh, obviously, uh, Brian was up at King Touch last year. He's coming to do a gig for us uh, at the end of this month. So, well, aye, I, I, took, uh, I, I took like, like the sad anorak that I am of seeing see uh, CDs from when from a, from a time when I used to still buy CDs, um, and I have like all the Beta Band albums on CD. I've got a couple of Steve Mason solo records as well, and I, I took them along to get them signed. But I, I didn't ask him to sign his name on all of them. I said. I want you to choose a, the first word that comes to your head when you look at that album sleeve. Mm-hmm. And for the three EPs, he just wrote Gateway. And uh, what was it? On, on the Hot Shots part, do, he put, um, uh, did he put best exclamation mark? What um, did he do on the uh, self-titled album, the one that they slagged off when it came out, remember? Uh, underworked. I quite like it. I yeah, like the whole five stuff. Think- I was speaking to his sound engineer, and he said, "I they, they didn't uh, they didn't think we didn't they weren't happy with it when it came out, and it was not well. There's, there's, it's all it's all been well documented, but they, they didn't they think it was rushed out and all the rest of it. So mm-hmm. um, was it legal, legal recordings? Yeah, I was saying to our, our sound engineer at Tuts when we, I was asking him if he'd listened to Steve Mason or the Beat Band before they arrived, and he said they, they, they did like them, and I said. You have no idea how influential they were as a band in, in the in the early two thousands. Like, I mean, if you listen to "Go Let It Out," by oh Lace, my god, aye, it's, it's pretty much a complete it's rip-up. A, it's a lift. It's a total uh, lift. And then Radiohead as well. I've cited them as being influence on them for for this sort of you know p- post KD stuff. Um, like, uh, uh, sorry, not post KD, post OK Computer stuff. So like your KDs and mm. Amnesiac and everything else. So yeah, it's pretty. Cool. Anybody out there who has not checked them out, check out Steve Mason, check out the Beta Band. And um, also, if you want to come to one of the Axon gigs, you will see some of the Axon faces. Jackie McNamara's up at the end of this month. So come along and speak Steve, to Jackie. Uh, a new pub as well in Sucky Hall Street, Don McNamara's. Don McNamara's, absolutely, really? yeah. You hear all the secrets. I mean, I, I can't share with you what Alan Thompson was telling us about David Ginola. Uh, maybe off camera, I can. But uh, yes, thanks everybody well, uh, for getting involved. I should mention I met Lawrence Connolly for the first time yesterday as well, and in, in the brazen head of all places. What an ex- <laughs> experience. Was he wearing double denim? No, he had these, uh, he had these um, what do you call it, a barber jacket on, his, his, his dog walking jacket. Um, I would imagine that's that's the, the image he sports. But um, I, it, was, it was good to meet good to meet Lawrence as well. We get, uh, we get about, we get about. I'm, I'm quite, Sorry. I met Scott McKinley as well, outside the ground on the way in. Uh, I think they're, they're what probably... a day you've had, JP. I mean, you've got your own bingo card for all the Celtic and Axon team that you've met just over the weekend. It's pretty wild, eh? <laughs> or, did they, or did they meet you, JP? Did they meet well, you? I'll tell you what, if the 1,200 strong that we're watching today are still coming through all the music chat, we should finish off with some football. And, we should, and I've seen it in the comment section that people want to know how did they get the women's team got on over the weekend, some good news. They beat Hibs over the weekend, which mm-hmm. puts them to only a couple of points in Glasgow City. And uh, on the better news, it was a poor day for Rangers, who conceded a 90-second minute penalty to Harps. I know Rangers can concede penalties, must just be in the women's game. Um, 
and they drop points, which means that it looks as if it's going to be a straight shootout between Glasgow City and Celtic for the title. And news coming out of Celtic the other day is that that game between Celtic and Glasgow City will be played at Paradise on the 11th of May. Uh, tickets are on sale, so I'd encourage everybody that's watching to go ahead and get some tickets, get up there, support the girls, take roll them on to victory, and hopefully we'll bring home our first ever Women's Premier League title. That would be phenomenal. A great achievement by Fran Alonso and the girls. But yeah, thanks for finishing up on uh, some football chat there, Colin Watt. Thanks to the 1200 Strong who have been tuning in on this Monday afternoon. Um, yeah, have a great week. And if you enjoy what you see on Axom, give us a thumbs up on the YouTube. It does help us to grow the channel. All that's left for me to say thank you again, Colin Watt, JP Mason, for joining me on a Celtic State of Mind.